So welcome to the second part in this introduction to channel hydraulics. And in this part, we're going to talk about some of the key concepts of open channel flow. Firstly, we'll deal with the key feature that makes open channel flow open. It's the free surface. Then we'll talk about uniform flow and the normal flow depth, which occurs under uniform flow conditions. We'll move on to talk about rapidly varied flow and, and the critical depth, mild and steep slopes, gradually varied flow and hydraulic controls, and finish with unsteady flow. Firstly, uh, the free surface. So the key feature of um, open channels that differentiates them from a pipe is that they have a free surface. Now, there's both good news and bad news with this free surface. The good news is it makes things easier because we know what the pressure is all the way along the open channel. It's at atmospheric pressure, or at least at the surface of the channel, it's at atmospheric pressure. That's different from a pipe because in a pipe, you can get um, pressure varying all the way along the channel, uh, all the way along the pipe. So good, that makes things easier. But what makes things harder is that the, the level of the surface of the channel, the water level of the surface of the channel, can vary. Obviously, that's different from a pipe where it's fixed because of the, the location of the pipe. But in a channel, it varies. So that introduces a new variable in our hydraulic analyses, the, the stage, which is the, the level of the water surface. So both good, news, good and bad news with a free surface. Next, I want to talk about uniform flow. So uniform flow is where we have a constant velocity all the way along the channel. So there's no acceleration or deceleration. And this um, river channel, this irrigation supply channel, more or less, um, uh, represents conditions of uniform flow. Now, under uniform flow, we get uh, the water depth um, it establishes what's called the normal depth. To understand um, why we get the normal depth, we need to think about the forces acting on the water within the river channel. So to do this, let's abstract uh, the, 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 um, the, the open channel to a, a body of water flowing down a prismatic channel. In fact, let's abstract it one step further just to a two-dimensional um, feature. So we're looking side on. We can see the bed of the river channel and the water surface, both with the same gradient because it's uniform flow conditions, right? Um, with a gradient of S. Um, and under these conditions, there's two forces acting on our body of water. There's the downstream component of gravity. That's the gravity acting along the river channel. Um, and then there's the flow resistance, which is um, created by the shear between the water body um, and the boundary of the channel, um, which acts upstream. And for the conditions of uniform flow to occur, these two forces must be equal. Because remember, under uniform flow, we don't have acceleration or deceleration, so the forces must balance. The downstream component of gravity must equal flow resistance. And at these conditions, we have normal depth. If the flow is at a depth greater than normal depth, then what will tend to happen is that the flow will accelerate, which increases the flow resistance, right? Um, until the flow resistance equals the downstream component of gravity, at which stage the water depth will have reduced to the normal depth. Similarly, if the water depth is um, less than the normal depth, the flow will tend to decelerate, reducing flow resistance until, again, we have a force balance and the water is at normal depth. So, uh, with this um, conceptual um, analysis, we can say something about um, these uniform flow conditions, that we will get a, a normal depth, and at the normal depth, the two main forces acting on the water body are equal. The next thing I want to talk about is critical flow. Now, critical flow is um, the condition where the wave speed is equal to the flow velocity. It's a sort of a a threshold condition um, at, at a particular flow depth, the critical flow depth. If the flow depth is above the critical flow at a higher, a higher depth, then we have what's called 
subcritical flow conditions. So the waves can propagate upstream. If the flow depth is less than the critical flow depth, um, then we have supercritical flow conditions. And under supercritical flow conditions, the waves can't propagate upstream. To illustrate uh, these different flow conditions, we can look at this, um, this bridge here and then flow, flow past the bridge abutment. Uh, the flow is moving from right to left in this image. And we see here a sort of a, a bow wave, if you like, upstream of this bridge pier. The fact that we have this wave forming here is evidence that we have subcritical flow conditions because the wave is in, was created by the bridge pier and it's moving upstream and establishing itself upstream of the bridge pier. As flow moves through um, the arches and under the bridge, it accelerates. And although we can't be sure simply from looking at this photo, it's likely that these conditions under through the tunnel are actually supercritical. They're the, the, where, where flow is accelerated, um, so depth is reduced past below the, the critical flow depth. And under these conditions, we generally get a fairly smooth uh, glassy surface of the water because the surface waves can't travel uh, upstream. Next I want to talk about a transition um, between supercritical and subcritical flow and vice versa. Now these transitions are called rapidly varied flow. One situation where you get a transition from subcritical to supercritical flow is where you get flow under a sluice gate. You know, sluice gates are sometimes used on weirs, for example, to release water from the weir to the downstream river. And at the sluice gate, the water accelerates under the sluice gate and emerges as um, supercritical flow with a high velocity and a low depth. Upstream of the sluice gate um, in the weir, we have subcritical flow where it's deeper and, and slow flowing. Now I've um, found this video, I tried to find a, a real um, sluice gate on a weir, um, but I couldn't find one. Um, but I found this video, which I really like. Um, uh, I really hope that uh, the uh, that T. Walpole, who made this video, doesn't mind me using it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. You can do it at home yourself. Effectively, it's a demonstration of this um, this principle of a, a flow under a sluice gate, and we see this transition, this rapidly varied um, uh, flow condition from subcritical to supercritical as flow passes uh, under the weir. Another situation where we get rapidly varied flow is at a hydraulic jump. And we can see a hydraulic jump forming here downstream of um, this weir. We have supercritical flow on the face, downstream face of the weir, um, and that transitions um, to subcritical flow at this hydraulic jump, which is a highly a sort of turbulent region, and it's a region where the flow depth actually increases. It's one of the few situations where, where, where rivers flow uphill. Um, uh, uh, without uh, um, any artificial means to propel it. Uh, we'll talk more about hydraulic jumps later on um, uh, in Topic 2. I also want to, to hear to talk about slope um, because there are two main types of slope. There's a, a, a mild slope and there's a steep slope. The mild slope is where the normal depth, that's the depth at uniform flow, right? The, the normal depth is greater than the critical depth. And we have um, a mild slope upstream of this weir. And then we have um, a, a um, steep slope, and we have a steep slope on the downstream face of this weir um, through here, where the normal depth, the depth at uniform flow, is less than the critical depth. And then it returns to a mild slope um, downstream of the hydraulic jump. So we've talked about uniform flow and we've talked about rapidly varying flow. Next, I want to talk about gradually varied flow. So this is varied in terms of variations through space along the river channel, not, not variations through time. We're still dealing with the conditions of steady flow, that is constant discharge through time. And here we have an example of a, um, a, a river channel at uniform flow um, conditions. Um, so we have normal depth along the, along the river channel. Um, no acceleration or deceleration. Now if we place a, um, a weir at the downstream end of this reach, um, what we get um, in terms of changes in the water surface profile is that the water depth is, is raised by the effect of ponding, um, 
or the ponding effect of the weir. Um, and then we have a backwater curve um, that extends upstream from the weir um, as the water surface profile gradually returns to the normal depth. Now this um, profile uh, through this, this uh, region here upstream of the weir um, is an example of gradually varied flow. That's where the flow velocity, the flow depth um, vary um, only gradually along the channel. So there's very slow acceleration or deceleration. Finally, I wanted to give an example of unsteady flow. We won't actually be tackling unsteady flow um, in this course at all. But just so you're aware, of course, discharge in a natural river is rarely constant um, through time and, and varies. And, and the classic example of that is a flood where we have um, conditions of unsteady flow. And um, a more sophisticated analysis of hydraulic um, conditions is required for these conditions. So that's the end of um, the, the second part of our introduction to channel hydraulics. There's a final part. The third part deals with um, some of the principles we use in channel hydraulics. Um, and you can move on to, to look at that video now.